I want to talk to you about subclinical myocarditis. There's new data that comes out from the European Society of Cardiology. It's from Switzerland, and in honor of that, I'm drinking coffee from my Swiss mug. Subclinical myocarditis and what it means for vaccination. Let me walk you through the available data. Now, we all know that mRNA vaccines are associated with myocarditis. It's rare, but it is an important safety signal. It's more likely to affect men than women. I'm talking about clinical myocarditis after mRNA vaccination, and it's more likely to affect people in a certain age range. And that age range is about 16 to 24. That's the peak demographic. And it's still important from 24 to 40. It's still important from 12 to 16. It's still probably important in 10 and 11, but it is most important 16, 17, 18, 19, 20. That's the core group with the absolute highest risk. What you see on your screen now is an analysis by Ali Krug, Josh Stevenson, and Tracy Beth Hogg that appears in a European journal that shows you a rate of myocarditis after vaccination stratified by age and gender. Now, many people try to purport that COVID-19 is worse than vaccination and that it's always worse than vaccination, but often what they do is they provide statistics for the aggregate population. They don't break it down for men in that certain age group. That's a mistake because you can figure out pretty clearly who are the men in that age group and you can provide different recommendations to those men. Pfizer has a post-marketing commitment, according to this US FDA, to provide these data, the data that I'm going to show you from Switzerland, the data that I'm going to show you from Thailand. They have an obligation to randomly sample and report troponin levels in people who have been vaccinated. This is part of their post-marketing commitment. The US Food and Drug Administration, they have never been good at post-marketing commitments. There are a number of government accountability office reports that show that to be the case. And here too, they're also not doing a great job. They've given Pfizer a long period of time, 2022, 2023, to generate these results. They have not reported these results. They're not obligated to do so until the end of this year. That's too long. It doesn't take that long to do this study. This study could be done in a few weeks. In fact, proof of that is it's already done in Thailand and it's already done in Switzerland and they have not that dissimilar conclusions. In the Thailand study, now this is the study of people undergoing SARS-CoV-2 mRNA vaccination, they're following them out into the future and they're looking at EKGs and troponins. People got distracted by the EKGs the EKG show a lot of things. Some of those things are normal. That's not the story in the paper or the preprint. The story is troponin, troponin going up in these boys. And that happened to go up in seven out of 202 boys for subclinical myocarditis rate of 3.5%. And this is from, in boys, this is from my sub stack where I break down this paper. You can go check it out, Vinay Prasad's observations and thoughts. Now, this is roughly two orders of magnitude greater than the known incidence of myocarditis, which is in the one to three to 5,000 ballpark. This is now we're talking about three percentage points, uh, one in 30. And so that's an important distinction to know how many orders of magnitude greater is subclinical from clinical myocarditis. Uh, this is also on par with earlier data from smallpox vaccine. So to me, it's plausible that it would be two orders of magnitude. Enter the new study by Christian Mueller from University Hospital Basel. This is the study that's been presented at the European Congress. Uh, it's a brilliant presentation. Somebody happened to send me a, a, a video of it. And these are just some excerpts from the presentation. It's myocardial injury after COVID-19, mRNA booster vaccination. He makes this good point, evaluating the true incidence of subclinical myocarditis of major importance. This information is required for informed decision-making for patients, physicians, and public health authorities, given the apparent need for repetitive, possibly yearly booster vaccinations for billions of humans worldwide with no end in sight due to diminishing protection months after the last COVID vaccine. So why does it matter? Even if a little bit of heart muscle is dying, if you're doing that year over year over year, Dr. Mueller is concerned, what is going to be the implication on the cardiac? function. What does that mean? Their study was quite elegant. You got the booster. Three days later, you got a high sensitivity troponin. They, anytime your troponin was elevated, they brought you in and made an evaluation. If they could link anything else under the sun to that troponin going up, anything else, they will attribute it to that instead of the vaccine. So the vaccine is the attribution of last resort. And that's what you're going to see here. You're going to see a conservative estimate of subclinical myocarditis. And in fact, these are the results, 777 people participating in the study. Most people don't have a troponin elevation on day three. We're going to come back to day three. Uh, but 40 people do have troponin elevations on day three. In 18 cases, they're chalking it up to something else. They'll chalk it up to something else half of the time. But in 22 cases, they're going to chalk it up to mRNA vaccine. 
And actually, some of the sex-specific results we're about to see might be due to this. I would love to see them tell me more about those 18 people they attributed to other reasons. What were those other reasons? It might be I went on a long run or something like that. I want to see that and also see what's the gender bias or the gender ratio in that group. Results. This was the bombshell result of the European Congress, which is the incidence of myocardial injury as represented by high sensitive troponin was 3.7% in women and 0.8% in men. This is 2.8%. And this is not that dissimilar from the Thailand estimate. It's not that dissimilar. Now, of course, one thing dissimilar is they're finding it more in women than in men. I wonder if that might be the adjudication process, but the aggregate statistic is roughly similar. And you're going to see it's roughly two orders of magnitude more common. This is something very interesting. If you had a troponin elevated on day three, they checked it on day four, and women had this fall, men had this fall, and Professor Mueller's point in the presentation was brilliant, which is, if it's falling like this between days three and four, what was it on day two? What was it on day one? We don't know because we didn't check. I don't blame them for not checking. They didn't know to check, but future investigation needs to check it every single day and needs to do it at baseline before they enter the study and should have some controls. It should be maybe even a randomized study, booster versus placebo. By the way, we still need to do those randomized studies so we can build this into it. This is an elegant figure. This is sort of a waterfall figure as we're used to in oncology, but presented for troponin where troponins are shown in uh, descending order. And what they've done here for every man and every woman in the study, they have found a comparable control that is covariate match. Now, covariate matching isn't perfect, and we can, we can talk about that, but this is, you know, the best available technique matching. You can listen to his talk to see how he did it. What is he trying to show you here? The controls are the light gray and the dark gray, the dark gray black, basically, is the people they are followed after the booster. And what he's showing you is it's not just the tip of the distribution that has elevated high sensitive troponin. It's that the entire distribution is right shifted. Everybody's having a little bit of elevation in high sensitive troponin. That's what this graph would have you infer. Now, to make it better, what I would do is I would have randomly assigned people to booster or a saline booster. And I think that's reasonable because you can always un un cross them over next month or something like that. And then I would get baseline troponins and troponins after the fact and then compare you know, the curves. That would be a better study rather than retrospectively trying to match them. But you know, it is a provocative hypothesis generating figure. Discussion. This is his point, not my point. Hypothesis is confirmed. The incidence is 2.8% or 800 times, which is two orders of magnitude, higher than what the passive surveillance systems document. And Professor Mueller is good to note, passive surveillance is a broken, flawed method that only documents a case if you actually have a concern and if somebody has the wherewithal to document it, and the U.S. system is incredibly flawed and many cases are slipping through the cracks, and that's very likely the reason why our estimates are slightly less frequent than the Israeli estimates and the estimates that come from Nordic countries where they are much better at tracking outcomes. Uh, he says that this is mostly mild. There's no major adverse cardiovascular events that occur within 30 days. I think that's fair to say. We're not worried that this is going to be dec that decremental, just one shot here or there. But we do know that kids who present with clinical myocarditis, actually, they don't do so well. You can go check that Lancet paper. Many are still taking furosemide and beta blockers, and I know people say that they have fully recovered. But if I was 22 and I have to take furosemide, I would consider that's not fully recovered. And if I'm 22 and you tell me I can't go for a run, my consideration is that is not fully recovered. This is about the impact of mRNA vaccine-associated myocardial injury on the long-term risk of arrhythmia and heart failure is unknown. Excellent point. Small extent of myocardial injury, one-fourth of spontaneous myocarditis suggests favorable outcome. And But the key question is the yearly booster has a cumulative burden of myocardial injury. We don't know. No one knows, but he's wondering. His overall conclusion, active surveillance of mRNA vaccine-associated myocardial injury, uh, likely more common much more common. When you do active surveillance, you see what the iceberg is under the water, and it occurs in one of 35 people, two orders of magnitude. The women versus men thing needs to be explicated. We need bigger, better data sets. We need to look, and we'll see. We'll get the answer to that question. My closing thoughts. How do you weigh this? How do you think about this? Everyone is thinking about this wrong. The question isn't 
vaccination with unlimited doses versus getting COVID. The question is this, is depicted in this. For everybody of every age, you walk in, you're going to get that dose one. Now, two things could happen. You could never come back again, in which case you're destined to get COVID-19, or you can come back again on the scheduled 21 or 28 day visit, get the second dose, in which case you're also, by the way, spoiler alert, destined to get COVID-19. And then you can come back five months, sorry, four months later and get the third dose. And then by the way, you're still destined to get COVID-19. And if you haven't, then you can come back and get two months later, the bivalent booster. And then guess what? You're probably also going to get COVID-19. All roads lead to COVID-19, okay? There may be more risk from the COVID-19 with less and less shielding, with less and less vaccine in you that might have a higher risk of bad outcomes. But as you get more and more doses in you, the risk of severe disease is going to fall. I mean, of course, it's going to fall. We have multiple data that shows that. But every time you get an additional dose of vaccine, you have some risk of myocarditis. And the Katie Scharf paper suggests that it's about one in 10,000 from the booster. Does it have a floor? We don't know if it has a floor. And there's subclinical myocarditis to pair with it. That's the Mueller paper. So at some point, this trade-off is likely to be unfavorable. And it's very likely to be different from an 80-year-old woman to a 18-year-old man. We have to acknowledge that. The CDC is playing a stupid game. This is what they just did. Everyone five years and older should get an updated booster. You can get it at least two months after your last dose of booster. For a 20-year-old man, we don't know if two months is safe or not safe. And we do have a failure here. The US government did not take this safety signal seriously. We should have made the company do randomized trials of different doses, different spacing between the doses, lowering the doses, different strategies for men, randomized trials in people who've had and recovered from COVID-19 versus those who have not had it to their knowledge and who are zero negative. We need different customized recommendations. A 20-year-old boy who got three doses and had Omicron may not benefit from the bivalent booster the same way an 80-year-old woman who's in a nursing home who's gotten four doses and has never had Omicron to her knowledge might. This could be very different. The risk-benefit profile could be fundamentally different. Their zeal, their zeal and zealotry for a one-size-fits-all solution is threatening the very institution of public health. They have lost their minds. They've pushed out the two smartest people at the table, Gruber and Krauss. They're left with the, 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 the worst decision-making I've ever seen. I had to carefully choose my word. I was thinking of a whole lot of worse things to say, but they've left with the worst decision-making I've seen. And so we need unbiased estimates of myocarditis, and we need thoughtful people to think about the risk-benefit profile. It's not one-size-fits-all. It's not unlimited doses versus no doses. It can be something in between. It can be lower doses. We need to maximize efficacy, minimize harm. That's the rule of biomedicine. So if you like this video, you know what to do. Like, subscribe, comment, leave a message below. And uh, in honor of the, uh, the folks in Switzerland who actually did, uh, did what Pfizer was supposed to do and what the FDA should have compelled them to do, until next time.